This is Malika Hook from the University of Colorado, and the topic today is normal or low-tension glaucoma. Let's start off with defining low-tension glaucoma. LTG is a chronic progressive optic neuropathy with characteristic optic nerve head cupping, RNFL thinning, and functional visual field loss, all of which occurs with an intraocular pressure under 22 millimeters of mercury. Pressure lowering is still the treatment focus, despite the lower intraocular pressure, but that's not where the story ends. Some of the causes that have been researched over the years include vascular dysregulation, hypotension, particularly nocturnal hypotension, lamina cribrosa abnormalities, which would make the specific eye more susceptible to damage at lower pressures, and autoimmune disorder. What does LTG look like? The truth is it looks very much like standard primary open angle glaucoma. These eyes are more likely to have paracentral defects and disc hemorrhages, and more likely to have focal notching with peripapillary atrophy. However, the most common visual field defect is still a supranasal visual field defect on Humphrey visual field testing, and the optic nerve cupping usually follows the standard isn't rule that we see with primary open angle glaucoma. The big question with NTG or LTG is often about the presence or absence of glaucoma. Is this a glaucomatous process? meaning LTG, or is it a non-glaucomatous process, meaning something that could be both sight-threatening as well as life-threatening that is mimicking glaucoma. Glaucoma is the most common optic neuropathy we see, and glaucomatous defects are well known to us. Sometimes the testing can be confusing, and the question is, how can we decrease the chance of missing the diagnosis? Let's talk about some case studies in visual field defects. First patient is a 69-year-old male diagnosed with normal tension glaucoma. The patient was told that he had normal tension glaucoma based on visual field defects and started on latanoprost a year ago. He's a high myope, minus eight diopters in both eyes. Pre-treatment pressure was 18 in both eyes, and the pressure on first examination is 17 in the right, 18 in the left. This is the OCT. You can see that there's poor capture on the right side. The OCT is reading peripapillary atrophy as being part of the optic nerve. Overall, however, no big red flags. This is what we see on visual field. You can see a quadrant defect, left eye, quadrant defect, right eye. And this should automatically make us think of something that is central in nature rather than true glaucoma. And on scan, you can see evidence of old infarcts involving the left occipital lobe. The patient was sent to the primary care physician and followed with visual field and SOCT for cup to disc asymmetry. Next patient is a 47-year-old male with a history of progressive visual field defect on the right side consistent with glaucoma and thinning of RNFL bilaterally on SOCT. Pressure on latanoprost was 13 in both eyes and the baseline pressure was in the high teens in both eyes. Dorzolamide was added to latanoprost when he was noted to have worsening of the visual field defect on the right side. Pressure is now down to 6 in the right, 5 in the left, but visual field defects are continuing to get worse and the patient was sent for evaluation by an outside ophthalmologist. He was noted to have a 1 plus APD on the right side, which was noted previous to his first visit with us. OCT shows average RNFL of 59 on the right, 71 on the left. Visual field defects are worsening on the right side between 2012 and 2013. You can see here a worsening of the superior and inferior depressions. On the left-hand side, you can see scattered nonspecific defects that fluctuate between 2012 and 2013. Because of the worsening visual field defect on the right-hand side, an MRI was obtained and showed an enhancing nodule abutting the clinoid process, right internal carotid artery, and right optic nerve. This is a case of coexisting low tension glaucoma with secondary causes of visual field defect. The advancing visual field defect, despite very low pressure on the right hand side, is what prompted ordering the MRI, and the patient was sent to neurosurgery for consideration of further intervention. Next patient, 78 year old male with history of low tension glaucoma. He had had ALT in both eyes. He was noted to have allergies to carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and alpha agonists, and he did not have an IOP lowering effect from latanoprost or travoprost. Pressure off drops was 16. Previous to that, while on drop therapy, patient had pressures between the mid to high teens. On visual field testing, the inferior visual field defect on the right side worsened between 2012 and 2013, and there was a dramatic increase in the visual field defect, both superiorly and inferiorly 
on the left-hand side between 2012 and 2013. The dramatic increase in visual field defect on the left-hand side prompted ordering of imaging, and the patient was noted to have an enhancing intracronal mass within the left orbit, and this was thought to be either metastatic disease or orbital lymphoma by the reading radiologist. This is a case of LTG getting worse in one eye and secondary causes for worsening visual field defect in the opposite eye. Rapid worsening of visual field defect on the left eye over a short period of time is what prompted ordering of the MRI, and the patient was sent to oculoplastics for further workup. Next patient is a 65-year-old with history of visual field defects on the left side attributed to dry AMD. Pressure is 14 in the right, 16 in the left, and the patient was sent over to us for cataract extraction with no history of glaucoma. The optic nerve head exam on the right side shows thinning of the neuroretinal rim along with slight tilting of the optic nerve, peripapillary atrophy, as well as signs of dry AMD. On the left side, we see a disc hemorrhage along with thinning of the neuroretinal rim, slight tilting of the optic nerve, and peripapillary atrophy. The two sites of disc hemorrhages are very obvious here, along with the changes of dry AMD that was noted before, drusen, and some atrophy of the RPE. Visual field examination shows non-distinct inferior visual field defects on the right side. Left side shows central paracentral visual field defects that could be attributed to dry AMD. This is a case of combined LTG and dry AMD. The Arnefel hemorrhage or the disc hemorrhage was the tip-off in this case. Patient had follow-up with retina, eventually had cataract extraction, and was started on latanoprost therapy and remains well-controlled. Last patient is a 75-year-old female presenting for follow-up of LTG. She initially presented as a glaucoma suspect in 2010 due to increased cup to disc ratio and was subsequently diagnosed as LTG in 2013 for nasal defects on Humphrey visual field left side. Visual acuity is 2030 on the right, 2040 on the left, pressure is 14 on the right, 11 on the left, and the optic nerve had showed increased vertical cupping on the right side with 0.6 cup to disc ratio vertical and horizontal on the left side with healthy looking rims. Visual field on the right side shows a relatively intact Humphrey visual field. On the left side between 2012 and 2014, there is an increase in the visual field depression seen nasally between, again, 2012 and 2014. Now, having seen this nasal depression that is respecting the vertical midline, if you scan back to the right eye, you can see around 2013 and 2014, there's an increase in the visual field defect uh, that is quite subtle in 2013, but a little bit more noticeable in 2014. Because of the binasal defects, imaging was obtained and shows a midline defect in the area of the pituitary gland. The MRI was read as likely represents a pituitary adenoma that extends into the sphenoid sinuses with compression of the lateral fibers of the optic nerve by the internal carotid artery. The tip-off again was the binasal defects that respected the midline, and the patient was referred to ENT for evaluation and treatment. The differential diagnosis for LTG is very, very long. On the left-hand side, you can see the glaucomatous causes whether it's primary open angle glaucoma, where the high pressures are not seen during clinic hours, intermittent acute angle closure glaucoma, where the pressure spikes, but when the patient is seen in the clinic, the pressure could be quite normal. We can also get artificially lower pressures in patients who have thin corneas, patients who had previous spikes in pressure because of corticosteroid use, uveitis, or trauma, and then the other causes that you see listed here, all of these can mimic low tension glaucoma. And it could be very hard to tease out the differences without a proper history. On the right-hand side, you see other causes like compressive, metabolic, toxic, inflammatory, or infectious optic neuropathies. And you should also include vascular injuries like giant cell arteritis, non-arteritic anterior ischemic neuropathies, and the others that you see listed here. These are all differential diagnoses that you should go through when the story isn't quite clear. When should we consider ordering neurologic, cardiovascular, or autoimmune tests? If the pallor is greater than the cupping, we should think of things other than glaucoma. If there's a non-retinal nerve fiber layer bundle visual field defect, in other words, if it is not respecting the horizontal midline as is typical with glaucoma, then we should consider something other than glaucoma dysoptic neuropathy. Cupping and visual field defects that don't correlate, vision worse than 2020 is not typical of early to mid-stage glaucoma. If you have horizontal over vertical cupping, again, that is not typical and doesn't follow the isn't rule that we look for in glaucoma. Color deficiencies are typically not related to glaucoma, especially in the early to late stages. It is possible in, in the uh, very end stages of glaucoma, but not 
not typically seen. So if we do see color vision deficiencies, we should be thinking of things other than glaucoma. Age less than 50. And progression despite having achieved a pressure of under 10. This is one of the primary things for me. If I have the pressure at 8 or 9 and the patient continues to get worse, I'm thinking about imaging in order to tease out some of the other differential diagnoses that might be causing an optic neuropathy despite control of pressure. My routine for normal tension glaucoma is to involve the PCP. We try to get sleep studies whenever possible. And if the patient's diagnosed with hypertension, we try to find out if they're taking their medications at night and if they might be over-medicated, in which case we can change their therapies around and try and avoid that night dip that might decrease the blood flow to the back of the eye. Autoimmune disease workup can be obtained in conjunction with the PCP, depending on physical exam and any other systemic complaints by the patient. Vitamin deficiencies and toxic exposures make for great test questions, but they are rarely seen in clinical practice in my experience. Neurologic workup, we involve the neuro-ophthalmologist when appropriate. We obtain MRI brain and orbits with and without contrast. We call the radiologist and discuss the clinical presentation, and we always look at the scans ourselves. Whenever possible, we try to get both diurnal and nocturnal pressure curves. Remember that around two-thirds of glaucoma patients have their highest IOP outside of clinic hours, most frequently during sleep hours. Supine IOP during office hours more closely mimics the peak IOP, so it's not infrequent for us to lay the patient back, wait for two to four minutes, come back in and check their pressure. Intraocular pressure measurements in the sitting position during normal office hours neither reflect the true range of an individual's IOP nor peak IOP or variation throughout the day. So if things are confusing, getting a 24-hour IOP whenever possible or having the patient lay down for two to four minutes and checking their IOP while supine might give you a little bit more of an idea of what the pressure is doing outside of clinic hours. We do know that some of our therapies control pressure during the nocturnal period like prostaglandin analogs, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, pilocarpine, and SLT. We also know that at least two of our medications have very little effect, timolol and bromonidine. We don't know much about pilocarpine on its own. The mention of pilocarpine above has to do with pilocarpine in conjunction with latanoprost therapy. And then there haven't been many studies on trabeculectomy and the effect of trabeculectomy on controlling nocturnal pressure spikes. If we see progressive glaucoma despite a pressure under 12, we start thinking about optimizing medications, discussing adherence to see if the patient is actually taking their medication. If there's no sign of nocturnal hypotension, and no alternate causes, what do we do now? We start thinking about the disease process being largely an IOP independent process. Trabeculectomy to get to single digits has been advocated, but is really easy to say and very hard to do. Complementary and alternative medications like ginkgo biloba to increase blood flow to the back of the eye is something I frequently recommend. Sleep positions, we try and avoid belly or side sleeping, especially on the side that's more affected. You can use a wedge pillow that goes from the small of the back all the way to the top of the head so that sleep occurs at an angle of approximately 30 degrees. This might decrease the spike in IOP that's seen during the fully supine position, although this is controversial. Alpha agonists can be used because of hypothetical neuroprotection. Some studies like Logitz indicated that alpha agonists might be better than beta blockers because of the potential risk for decreased blood flow when using beta blockers. And some have advocated that the study conclusions indicate alpha agonists are neuroprotective, although that's a leap beyond what the data actually say. Memantine is something that was studied extensively in the past, but failed the primary endpoints for neuroprotection. Some physicians choose to use it off-label still when nothing else can be done. Same thing with calcium channel blockers, which were extensively studied both in the US and Japan and found to have a hint of neuroprotection. We also always refer these patients to low vision for a consultation and a discussion of lifestyle changes and assistive aids when their vision hinders their activities of daily living. Next time you see progression despite what appears to be appropriate IOP control, please think of this. This is a patient that we asked to put a single drop on the eye. She started off by actually dropping the bottle on the floor, looks around to make sure nobody saw that, and then pulls back the lower eyelid again. We asked her to put one drop on the eye. And you can see here what happens. A lot of rubbing of the conjunctiva, one, two, three, four, five, I don't know, six maybe drops, most of which went on the cheek. And we have to think of this, it's, um, it's not intended to be a joke, it's not intended to be funny. Um, I have a hard time putting drops on mine, I bet several of you do as well. So just keep this in mind. Sometimes it's not very easy to put the drops on it. We should think about alternative therapies like SLT 
or some of the injectables uh, that are either on the market or coming to the market that would give us sustained delivery of medication for lowering intraocular pressure. Let's close off with take-home points. Diagnosing and following glaucoma for progression requires the synthesis of multiple data points, nerve, visual field, imaging, IOP. Consider peak IOP, diurnal curve in the office, and nocturnal hypotension, getting a sleep lab involved whenever possible. Switch from the combination of beta blocker alpha agonist to a combination of PGA and a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor for nighttime control. Consider SLT as well, especially when adherence might be an issue. Check for drop technique and adherence as mentioned with the previous video. With rapid progression of visual field defect, always consider other causes. Low tension glaucoma often requires a team approach between the eye care professional and primary care physician. Glaucoma or glaucoma suspect can coexist with other processes like age-related macular degeneration, both of which can influence the visual field. And we should all have a low threshold to investigate other causes with imaging. If you think about it, investigate it. For further educational resources, consider visiting keogt.com. This lecture and many other lectures will be posted on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for your time.